Well, thanks, Frederica, and welcome back to our second uh, session today as a part of Round Tables Europe 2022. Environmental, social, and governance, ESG. New regulations are being introduced linking sustainability to financial performance in all new ways. And while at the first glance, solar and energy storage seem to tick all of the ESG boxes, it won't meet all of the criteria in the very near future. Welcome to this solar, in solar Sustainability in Practice session of Roundtables Europe 2022. I'm Jonathan Gifford, the Editor-in-Chief of PV Magazine Global. And this session is actually a part of our UP initiative. And Becky Beats, who is our Head of Content, is also the driving force behind UP. And she joins me here today. Hi, Becky. Hi. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we launched the UP initiative in 2019 when we realized um, how important the topic of sustainability was becoming, even for a green industry like solar. And since then, we've made it our mission to cover topics like supply chain transparency, circularity, finance, and greenwashing. Renewables have the chance to set a new green status quo when it comes to the provision of products and services. They also have the chance to address the myriad societal problems we face, like structural racism, food security, and energy independence. With ESG, these issues are rising to the top of the agenda. In just a few moments, we'll assemble a panel of solar sustainability champions, including Adele Chow from Trina Solar, Ines Monroe from Stiag Solar, Energy Solutions, and Alison Lennon from the UNSW. But before that, let's take a little bit of a cl closer look at ESG investment and finance. A leading financial expert recently said that ESG represents a fund fundamental shift in how we do business. This is its value, and the opportunities are enormous. For the first time, sustainability is being directly linked to a company's financial performance. Over the next three years, as legislation comes in, they must comply. On the flip side, there's increasing levels of green finance, as our first guest, Maya Godema, Sustainable Finance Associate at Bloomberg New Energy Finance can attest to. So, welcome, Maya. It's great to have you here today. So, we don't seem to be able to hear you. Can you try talking again, please? Yeah, sure. Oh, perfect. Can you okay. hear me now? Now I can hear you. Yeah, it's great to have you. Tell me, um, as a start, how much investment is flowing into ESG and, sustain and green finance? So it's really interesting when you look at like sustainable investing. I actually got a quote from your previous panel saying that they don't need subsidies. They need capital. And there is actually a lot of capital at hand. The first thing that people need to realize is the amount of money that is going into ESG exchange trading funds. So these are funds that are traded on exchanges and are that are gathering a lot of inflows at the moment. So um, these funds have, like as you mentioned, either an environmental, a social, or a governance purpose, or a mix of the three. They integrate these kind of factors a lot. And that is really good when it comes to um, bringing capital. According to our research, the, the amount of, of capital going into these ETFs is actually growing year on year. Last year was actually a record year where we almost reached $140 billion of inflows into these ETFs. Um, as you can see from the left-hand side, actually, however, the number of flows into ESG ETFs has dropped at the beginning of this year. The main reason for that is that we see growing skepticism around what represent an ESG investment. Um, and actually, it's, it's going to be really interesting um, that you talk about that in your panel after. So this is the first part. The first part is around ETFs. And these ETFs can be like direct investment through equity capital or debt investment if the ETF is a fixed income, in, uh, a fixed income ETF. The other like side of, of um, capital that we're seeing flowing into uh, sustainable projects or sustainable debt. So <clears throat> the way we see ETFs with more retail investor, institutional investor putting money into these funds, we're also seeing a lot of capital being raised through bonds and loans to environmental, social, or governance projects. 
So as you can see, like the main area of, of issuance is the green bond, um, is the green bond uh, asset class. So it's any bond that is raised to finance a green project or activity. And this has been followed more recently by a sustainability linked loan that can be invested in, in any kind of projects or activity, but that tie the repayment of a specific loan um, to the achievement of a sustainability target. So all of this seems great, right, Becky? Like, it, like we're seeing a lot of inflows coming. The only thing and I wanted to highlight today is the fact that most of, his, of this investment is going to the same region. So um, before the panel was like mostly focused on Europe and actually Europe got a big chunk of the pie. Um, it's, been, it's been mostly going to, to the EMEA region, even if last year we saw a peak of investment in the, in the Americas. The main reason for that is that Europe has the strongest regulatory uh, framework around sustainable investment and also the, the pledges that have been made by European regulators really bring stability, a stable vision to, to investors thinking, okay, I can invest in a green project in, in, in Europe because I know that there is like a favorable policy, um, policy uh, uh, framework in, in that area. I just come back from New Delhi where I was yesterday um, and, uh, and effectively uh, they're, they're also missing that big chunk of the market. So Asia is a, is a big topic as well. There's going to be need for a lot of investment outside of China. And this is what needs to ramp up. So we need to see ramping up of capital in other regions apart from, from EMEA and also in different sorts of, of, um, of sectors. So far, most of the green bonds that have been uh, raised were raised by, by companies that uh, either comes from the energy, renewable energy or power generation sectors or any kind of, of company that can easily see a green project, but we're not seeing a lot of investment being made in heavy emitting industries. And that's an issue because you could totally imagine a total or um, any kind of, of hard to abate, uh, a company from hard to abate sector raising capital to ramp up their renewable business and wrap up their, their PV projects as well to, for instance, generate electricity for themselves. So that's another point that we're seeing. Thank you, Maya. Just um, quickly to wrap up, there is a lot of optimism and capital flowing in. However, there have been some scandals recently um, about the false labeling of green financial products. Do you think this will affect the investment levels? Just a, a quick summary there. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, like when I showed the first, uh, the first slide around the drop of, of ESG investment, like at least ESG uh, ETF inflows, that shows how badly managed um, ESG projects can lead to growing skepticism and a, and a loss of credibility of these kind of investments. But I mean, I'm optimistic. We're seeing a lot of regulations being pushed out in the, in the EU, so, so that could, could really help. Great. Thank you, Maya. It's really great to hear your optimism for the sector and also the opportunity that we have to fundamentally change business and that solar is set to benefit for this. Thank you so much, Becky. I hope I see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Take care, Maya. Well, now let's take a closer look at the steps that solar companies are taking to meet ESG requirements. Adele Shao is the head of product solutions and marketing Europe for Trina Solar. Adele spent over a decade with the company and is now a key leader of its European operations. And she joins us today from Zurich. Adele, lovely to see you and welcome to Roundtables 2022. Oh, it might just take a moment to get your sound. Oh, hello again, Adele. Can I, can I hear you? Can you hear me? Uh, I can oh, now. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us and for making the time. Now, I know that Trina has been very active in terms of um, um, spreading the word about its sustainability efforts. Can you please take us through some of those? Yeah, sure. So first, thank you everyone uh, for uh, being with us today. And uh, today I would like to share actually 
two stories about Trina and also one story about myself and uh, about ESG. So I think when we talk about ESG, first we should start like, why are we doing this? We know we're in the green industry, but how can we do better? What goals we try to achieve here together? First, I want to take you back 20 years in time in China. So actually, this is a village uh, where Trina started our business a long time ago. So, you know, in West China, there are a lot of village in mountain without electricity. I think it's not, um, not that uncommon around the world. And a lot of people there need electricity. For example, for kids, they actually don't have electricity at night. It's really difficult for them to live there, to get better education. So 20 years ago, Trina sent a team over there and really first time for the kids over there to see electricity, to see lights light up at night that completely changed their life. This is actually the real story of our um, founder, Mr. Gao. And the moment the kids saw the light, the eyes really inspired him, continue to today, inspiring everyone in Trina to actually produce more solar energy for the world because we don't just provide solar energy, we actually change life of a lot of people around us in the world. So I think this really inspires us a sense of social responsibility, the actually first thing about the ESG, right? The social responsibility part. So what we continue to do, I think it's not just Trina alone, but here I give you some idea of what Trina has been doing in the past 25 years. We continue to build actually a lot of system, in, especially in remote areas and also for schools, especially for um, these region which have no electricity or we help them to improve their life, to help the society to be a better place for everyone to live and also for the generations to come. So this is really essential as a company, what we do, and we have to continue to do to make a world a better place for everyone to live. And now I want to share with you a second story. This is actually my story. Maybe West China, Africa sounds a bit far away for you. If we talk about Europe, I have been living in Europe for seven years. I have really a big hobby to take wandering around in Switzerland. This is actually the village where I live at the moment. It's really beautiful. I really admire the nature, the beauty of Switzerland. And I really love the place I live. So these are pictures actually I took them by myself. I really love it. Sometimes you will see even really lovely animal jumping around like deer you may see on this picture, right? How would you imagine Actually, last year in July, we had a huge storm in Switzerland, in Zurich, actually. And this is a picture I took after that storm. It really hit me hard because when we talk about climate change, even we're in the industry, we say, oh, it's, yeah, it's getting warmer, but until you really see it in front of your face. And then I start to reflect again what we have been doing to find the climate change because it's so real. It's in front of everyone. And this is exactly happening in the village where I live. So how can we tackle further and speed up the transition <laughs> to help the world to find the climate change? I think as a company, again, Trina, just one of the big industry, we have to continue to deliver a lot of very good clean energy solution to the world to solve the problem. In Trina's case, we provide modules, which you know mostly. We also do tracker, PV system, energy storage, the goal and mission is clear where the world needs us to find a solution to speed up the transition, find the climate change will be there. We're going to continue to reinvest into this business. Over the 25 past uh, five years, we have already delivered 100 gigawatt solar module to the world over 100, 100 countries. You may not understand what it means exactly. I want to give you one example. In Germany, there's three still um, operational nuclear power plants. The largest one is 1.41 gigawatt. And we have alone one company shipped already 100 gigawatt in the last 25 years. There are many more out there, and I believe we can do more for the world. Also, we have built 5.5 gigawatt solar power plants reconnect to the world. So this, we have to do more and deliver more really good solution and product to the world to help to solve the problem we have. In terms of the products, 
I think many um, like, um, presenter already mentioned, we're already in the green industry, but how to make a green product greener, this is essential. So as a company, a leader in the industry, we keep tracking all the energy and the resource consumption we're using into our products. Here, just an example. We track natural gas we use, power consumption, water consumption. Over here, we try to um, reduce the energy consumption through innovation. Also, we have energy efficiency in, uh, improvement plan in all of our factory. And the achievement is quite um, outstanding. And here you can see from 2021 compared to 2020, for example, for the cow consumption per megawatt, we reduce 42.4%. We know this is not enough. We want to be um, like carbon neutral. So this is our goal. We have to really reduce as much as possible in the future to contribute to make the solar products greener. And we also, because we're also a project developer, we also build solar power plants. I know in Europe, for example, uh, we talk a lot about agri-PV. It's really a perfect example here. We just want to show you some example we have done as a company with our partner. We build some fissionary PV project. So actually there's fish farm under the PV solar power plants. And so this solar farm are not just solar farm, but they're also fish farm. So it's a perfect example to combine uh, the solar and the agriculture. So we minimize our impact to the nature. So I believe we can do more in the world, but here are just some example to show you. So, this two story I share with you, just some small example we have done and why we are doing it, the goal we try to achieve here together. But as a company, as an industry, there's so much more we can do to contribute to these goals. And here are some goals Trina as a company and the team we're focusing on. And we believe together we can really contribute much more into the world. So when we talk about ESG, again, the one point I want to make, it's not just because we do it, we because we need a report, we want to be compliant, but it's really we want to achieve something great together to change the world, to make uh, this a better place to live. So if you want more information, we have a ESG report. You can look at it. We know we're, it's not perfect. There are a lot of places we can do more and uh, improve. So um, but here today, just want to show you something we have done as a company. Again, thank you very much. So let's produce more solar energy for everyone in the world. Thank well, you. That's, that's a really nice message and some great personal stories, Adele Zhang. Thank you very much for giving us that overview of what Trina Solar is doing. Adele is the head of product solutions and marketing for Trina Solar Europe. And um, yeah, I think, I think some key messages to scale, but to also remain very much focused on ESG as a core part of what we do as an industry. And, and, and interesting to see the energy consumption also from Trina as a good example of how um, the carbon footprint can be reduced. Becky. Absolutely. As Maya said at the beginning, companies that are ahead of the game in terms of environmental protection, supply chain transparency, and recycling, for example, will be the winners. Today's panel, we're bringing together four experts who are leaders in their field to discuss how solar manufacturing can meet these new ESG requirements. And I'm delighted to say they're all women. They're going to be focusing on circularity, materials, project development, and the wider social community as we approach terawatt scale. Jonathan, who's joining us today? Well, as I mentioned, Adele will be joining us again. Adele Zhao <laughs> from Trina Solar. Maria Franco, an associate professor, Circular Economy, Bern University of Applied Sciences. Alison Lennon, who is the chief scientist with SunDrive Solar and also an adjunct professor at the UNSW. And Ines Monroe, global business development and brand manager with Steag Solar Energy Solutions. Uh, ladies, thank you very much for joining us today on Roundtable Zero. Oh. Thanks to you for having us. Thanks to you for inviting us for this um, to talk about this subject, which is of high um, interest currently in the sector. Yeah, high interest indeed. Becky. Adele, um, you've just spoken to us about the fact you've created your first ESG report. There seems to be a lot of confusion about the ESG rules that are coming in. 
and a lot of people are saying that it requires a restructuring of business, that you need to remove internal silos. How has Trina approached this issue? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question. Definitely, because um, we have been working with uh, many investors, a uh, utility company. When we uh, talk to them, actually, everyone has a bit different um, requirement on ESG. And I think so for, for as a company, sometimes it's quite difficult to um, to really to fit everyone's need. So that's why we, we actually step back and reflect exactly um, actually what I showed you. First, I think we have to understand what problem we try to tackle together regarding ESG, why we are doing it, what goals we want to set. So in the ESG report, you will see we set a very clear goal. We don't just show what we have achieved, but we also set the goals in the next years to come as a company. For example, uh, energy consumption, resource use, uh, everything. So of course, again, it's not perfect, may not meet everyone's need. But as a company, we try to fulfill the goals and mission we, we started in terms of ESG. Thank you. Ines, um, as a project developer, how do you approach this issue? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, actually, I think there are three main pillars um, for a developer, but also uh, for an EPC uh, service provider such as uh, Sense and, and also O&M uh, service provider. Um, and I think these are responsibility, uh, a deep understanding of the local needs, and also holding hands with who will be the future owner of the asset, as Adele was mentioning, because it actually guides the whole project. Fortunately, um, owners of assets are involved in early stages of um, the development of a project. Um, this is also actually encouraged more and more by regulators. Um, and I think this uh, actually gives a lot of maturity to the projects and make them um, fulfill um, interesting um, targets of these um, owners and also fulfill missions uh, contributing to the um, rise of the standards of living of humanity as a whole and protecting the environment. But just to go back to the responsibility side, um, I think this is a very important item because on the one hand side, as developers, and specialized actors in the market, we have to make the most out of the available technology. So we have to really assure the assets will last for long. Secondly, there is a lot of effort invested in finding the correct location and obtaining all the permits and licenses and authorizations. So there is also efficiency um, to gain while we take advantage of all this effort invested in the, in the first um, stage. Secondly, understanding of local needs requires communication and requires the ability to engage communities and be ready to compromise. These are very important items. I will further into um, how Sense is approaching this in terms of creativity and in terms of being really close to the communities while at the same time keeping a broader spectrum and bringing oral knowledge of cooperation and development scenarios and what is being done in other countries that are very sensitive to the social impact. Uh, Maria, you're involved in the EU funded Circusol project, which is developing mm -hmm. circular business models and processes for solar manufacturers. How do you think circularity can help meet these new ESG reporting requirements? Well, thank you for the question, too. Um, I think circularity speaks directly to uh, the aspects that ESG tries to cover, namely environmental, social, and governance. Um, specifically, I would say on the environmental side, when uh, product manufacturers and the rest of the stakeholders within the solar value chain can drive improvements across the entire um, product life cycle, that is from product design up to the last very stage of recovery and recycle, um, I think this makes them very much ready, um, at least in theory, um, for disclosure. Um, in the ESG sense. Uh, so for instance, when we talk about uh, product design, that would entail uh, design for repairability and recycling of PV modules. And this in turn would 
um, entail, for instance, minimizing uh, non-reversible uh, diseases and bones, uh, modular product construction, um, encapsulants um, uh, with release layers or no encapsulants at all and so on. Um, when we talk about business models and we keep going along the product life cycle, um, then not concentrated only on you know full ownership models, which is what we're used to, but also opening the room where the situation allows it for product service systems, right? And of course, um, legal administrative barriers would need to be um, would need to be solved in certain locations for this to happen. This is some of the things we've at Circus or tried to look at. Um, then when you keep on moving in the product life cycle, when you talk about reuse. Um, you know, support through a standardization, uh, the preparation for reuse and making sure that those modules, BB modules that are eligible for reuse could be deployed and could be tested um, and standardized um, in different markets, then uh, recycling. And last but not least, I would say thinking about how technologies can enable um, all of the circular strategies, right? So this would entail not only circular KPIs, but also the use of different technologies throughout the product's life cycle to create, uh, measure, and also improve um, all the circularity potential. Mm. Okay. Product. Well, thank yeah. you very much. My th thank you very much for everyone for those first answers. You can see immediately just how uh, such a broad field, um, ESG and sustainability in solar, right? From product design through to manufacturing itself, um, a huge amount that can be done on the project development side as well. And Alison Lennon from uh, UNS. W. Um, I also want to, and, and from SunDrive, most recently a startup based in Sydney. Thanks for joining us from Sydney today. Um, I know that we've had a lot of discussions just very recently in the last kind of two or three years about material consumption within manufacturing. Um, we can design for more circularity, as we were just hearing from Maria, um, but we can also design for, for less material consumption in production. And as we scale towards uh, terawatt scale production, this is going to become increasingly important important. What's your take on the way things are moving within PV manufacturing in terms of material consumption? Um, thanks for the question, Jonathan. It's actually a very interesting time um, in PV manufacturing. Uh, as I think most people are now really realising that PV is going to play a major role in decarbonisation, most PV manufacturers are critically looking at their supply chains to make sure that they can sustainably produce the materials that they need to make the amount of modules that they need to make. So I guess while the world only made 200 gigawatts of modules each year, uh, we didn't need to think that much about whether we had enough of the different types of materials that we needed. But making four to five terawatts is another matter. So I guess with the cells, I mean, the material that's come into focus most in recent times has been the use of silver. So most, most PV modules uh, use silver for their cell metallization. And with the current PERC technology, um, they currently would use about um, 15 tonnes of silver per gigawatt of production. So if you were to scale that to produce uh, one terawatt, uh, which isn't infeasible by 2050, then you're going to use up more than 50% of the world's 2019 silver production, right? And that clearly isn't something that we want to do. Now, manufacturers are looking at this and there are a number of solutions, you know, using, using copper paste and maybe copper plating. And so I don't think it's an, um, an insolvable problem. If you move on to modules, uh, modules use a lot of glass and aluminium as well. And you need to think about those materials, although aluminium is not in short supply. Uh, if you produce aluminium by primary production, and we will need to use primary production because there simply aren't enough modules to be recycled to produce enough aluminium through recycling. The emissions that will be generated from producing all that al aluminium are quite substantial. And so it's going to be very critical for the industry, the aluminium industry, to be able to decarbonise very quickly as we rapidly scale up into terawatt levels of manufacturing. Now, once again, like the silver issue, it's not insurmountable, but it does need um, the industry to consider decarbonising very quickly so we can actually produce modules um, without low emissions. So I think going forward, uh, manufacturers will consider sustainability quite importantly, 
and I'll, they'll consider it because it will affect their bottom line. It's going to become more expensive if you have to source a material that's in limited supply because its cost is going to go up. And similarly, if aluminium, if you use aluminium that um, is gener generated through a lot of emissions um, in primary production, then modules will probably cost more because they'll incur border taxes and so forth. So I think manufacturers will consider sustainability quite seriously in their future production. Okay, thank you, Alison. Adele, I'll bring you in. I think as a manufacturer then, how, how much uh, you know, attention to detail is being paid um, within Trina? And, and if you look more widely across the industry in terms of material consumption, but also you know, low carbon module production. Yeah, I think I agree with uh, what Alison said, right? Um, so we, if we want to reach uh, so much capacity, we need a lot of material. So it's one is for sustainability reason. The second is also for economic reason. Um, we know, for example, I just heard actually, I just sort of watched the news um, for some region, the electricity price go just up 15% overnight. So it's incredible. So for us, um, actually how we tackle this issue, first we start from the R&D part. So we have to design the product and solution using less material. And also we, had, we can have to open up with maybe different type of material to tackle. So for example, aluminum, we also consider steel. So to have the option, also, um, we encourage a lot of partnerships. So for example, uh, just give you an example for Europe in particular, because Europe has a lot of rooftop system, and you may notice for a rooftop system, um, the mounting structure is also aluminum. So for the module frame, it's also aluminum. So both are aluminum putting together. So I think a co-engineering design to minimize the material usage between module and mounting structure is also essential. Right. This is a mechanical part. For electrical part, we can work with inverter companies together to see how to minimize also, uh, you know, uh, material usage. So these are essential. We don't work alone. That's what I mean. We have to work with partners to minimize material usage and also open up, see what alternative we have. Recycling is essential. <laughs> Maria also just mentioned. So we also, um, from the beginning of the design, we try to see okay, which material can be recycled mostly. So for example, aluminum actually in this case is a really good choice. We actually, Trina is also the first company to have gigawatt scale of double glass module compared with the back sheet, right? Glass can be really recycled. So this is, we actually set up a team dedicated internally. It's not really public, we don't really market it, but we do have a team, a material team, really focusing on recycled material. So that's something we actually, as a company, working on okay. at the moment. Also, we have been, of course, working on recycling, how to tackle in each region. So it's yeah. what we have. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Adele. Uh, interesting, you, you say a kind of system approach, so, so integrating, working together along the value chain, the module producer with the mounting system pr uh, provider or the power electronics provider. Ines, uh, this is where a project developer like yourself might come in, and you mentioned earlier that you, know, you see a, a key role of, uh, as a project developer, working with asset owners, really bringing them um, along the journey in terms of delivering a, a sustainable solar asset at the end of the day. When you look at you know different module providers and component providers how closely um, are you considering sustainability concerns or carbon footprint these kind of things yeah so I think the key word here is innovation as um, my fellow speakers mentioned I think this is part um, intrinsic in, inherently actually part of the technology we have always been in continuous evolution, and we're certainly ready to face this challenge. Um, this innovation certainly brings us to um, a less amount of raw materials uh, involved in the manufacturing. It also brings us to lowering the energy consumption and obviously sourcing the production facilities with renewable energy sources. And then, which is something uh, SENSE is already uh, taking steps uh, into is um, choosing suppliers that are no longer including toxic materials such as cadmium telluride in the uh, production of the cells. Um, but I wanted to mention also uh, the responsibility regarding 
uh, transportation. So the fact that there is less materials being used, mm -hmm. such as reducing the, um, the size of the frame, can actually mean a lot in terms of transportation, being able um, to handle more amounts in one sole container. So this is something, um, as usual, um, small actions can have big impacts. So I really appreciate, I, I'm following actually all the innovation that is being done, not only by China, but other um, players in the market. And I'm, I'm really interested in, in seeing all the evolution. But I would like to add, and this is more important in, in terms of uh, developer and certain key um, provider of projects, and it is all those additional elements that have nothing to do with the equipment in itself, but that come to increase the performance and therefore the lifetime of a project. And therefore, as I mentioned earlier, making the most out of the available technology to generate as much energy as possible in the longest period of time. And here there is the design that has a lot of importance. Um, so gaining um, insights and gaining experience in how to design projects, how to align um, the solar modules, how to or orientate them is crucial in the generation of power. And then there is an importance in O&M and digitalization as a way to increase the yield and the lifetime of a, of a project. Certainly there are external factors we cannot control such as the, the heat or the dirt or the shade, but if we have a tool that can predict and that can um, give us uh, the best alternatives um, to, to address this, then uh, we're gonna be more efficient. Uh, obviously there is a regular maintenance to be carried out by the owner of the asset and then uh, making the most out of artificial intelligence and digital solutions um, can really uh, bring a, a lot in the sustainability uh, of a project and also in, in enable um, O&M service providers get very important information about which are the suppliers of equipment that are doing a good job because this is going to be data that is going to be objectively gathered yeah. not only by uh, uh, of one project but about all the projects that for example a global company that sends um, is uh, monitoring and is looking after in, in, in operation and maintenance all over the world so we can cross-check a lot of information and reach uh, um, conclusions um, that will definitely help us define which are the best manufacturers um, in the long run. Um, this is this is basically um, what a developer can can look into these days, and, and Sense is very sensitive to to this matter. Actually, we're talking a lot about making new modules, new materials, recycling, <clears throat> but there are other options. As Marie, uh, Maria, sorry, your for, your main focus of your research is use cases for second life modules. Do you really think it can move mm -hmm. beyond the niche? Well, I think from the secular perspective of um, lengthening material cycles, it makes um, sense to definitely focus on reuse. As you said, we have been discussing a lot about uh, virgin raw materials and new um, pan and manufacturing. Um, the, re uh, the results we've had from our research, we've actually developed a simulation model um, that sort of tries to map out the diffusion of uh, PV reuse um, within the country case of Germany. And this is just because uh, we have data availability for this, so we have been tracking this down. And it basically goes down to the question of volume availability. So volume availability for uh, panels that would be preparation in preparation for reuse. And this volume basically depends on the trajectory of the installation rate in a specific location. So this is a question that really needs to be answered in a one-to-one, -one, I would say one-to-one -one setting in, 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 in different um, country settings. I, um, it, as, I say, as I said, it depends on the installation rate, on the shape of the installation rate. If you take a look, then, um, other uh, PV module lifetime, um, and you put that, you know, throughout time, you can calculate um, after how long people have uh, PV modules ready for recycling. And then also the question here comes, as I said before, when you talked about standardization um, for reuse, to think about which age cohort 
will be eligible for reuse. This is something that's not defined. It could be, for instance, 0 to 6, 0 to 10, 0 to 12. This is something um, that's completely um, in the air right now. So that would be something that needs to be um, defined. Also, the different types of degradation rates, for instance, in different um, locations, how also the different types of defects and failures in the PV modules can be economically repaired or not. This would start, you know, diminishing the volume that you have um, in those panels that are in preparation for reuse. After that will be the actual deployment rate in the market of these um, panels for reuse. And after that also what you get in terms of um, <clears throat> uptake rate for um, panels. So I think it really depends um, in trying to investigate on a country specific location, which would be the use cases in which, you know, um, customers and society will be able to take up these reuse modules. Would it be commercial, public, um, you know, PV for agriculture, off-grid applications, mm -hmm. floating PV and so on. Um, and I think also, just to finish the question here also, I think tackles the social aspect of ESG when you talk about energy access and energy independence um, of, of panels that are sent abroad, for instance, in the case of Europe, when not needed anymore, they're sent abroad um, for use. So I think also um, this question of reuse goes beyond the environmental aspect also to cover social ones. And I think you bring up a key point there that it, you have to look at any of these aspects, whether it be manufacturing, deploying projects um, or reuse, it has to be on a country specific basis, looking at the, the specific uh, factors that play into this environmental and social context. We're running out of time, <clears throat> so I'm going to skip a, a couple of questions now and go back to Alison to, to round the panel off today. Um, you, with your research into materials, where do you see other major opportunities for circularity within solar manufacturing? So I think um, reuse of materials in clean energy technologies generally is going to be absolutely critical because clean energy technologies are more material intensive than um, fossil fuel technologies. But it's an interesting phase, this growth period where um, we have a lot of clean energy technologies such as PV scaling up to very high um, capacities. And there is simply not the volume of PV modules coming to end of life to sustain the materials growth that will be required. So for example, with PV in the next 20 to 30 years, there's going to, it's going to rely a lot on primary production to actually produce the materials that are required to make the modules. Then you get to a point where you do get to have a chance of having a circular economy, and then reuse is going to be absolutely critical. So I think with PV modules, there are a lot of easy gains and there's some harder gains. So the easy gains are clearly the aluminium frames, and recycling of these aluminium frames is, is, is relatively straightforward like aluminium is often referred to as infinitely recyclable. And if you take the aluminium frames off and you recycle them in one billet, they, you have the same alloy too. So you don't have the problem of alloy mixing. So aluminium is, is highly recyclable. The copper can easily be extracted from ribbons and wires. Um, the glass may be becoming a little bit harder and then other materials like um, silver and silicon even even perhaps harder. But these are these are um, areas where um, innovation is required. We need to find lower emissions methods of recycling modules um, so that we can actually make the, um, the economics of module recycling far more attractive than they might be today. I think we also, and I, I think this has been touched on um, by other speakers too, we need to think about the design of modules and to think about how we can design modules so they can be more easily recycled. And one really good example of that is the NICE technology, module technology that has been developed in Europe, where you don't have encapsulant in the module, and that makes it so much easier to recover the materials of the modules. So, so I think we need to be open to looking at new technologies that make the modules easier to recycle and easier to reclaim and reuse the materials um, in the modules for further 
production. And I think that's another key point you raise, Alison, that, that sustainability is so embedded in design, and that's where we really need to go back and look at how products are designed so they can have a further life, and we can put them into different recycling methods and reuse um, case scenarios. We've covered um, a very large array of important and interesting topics today, um, and we will be following up in more depth on these issues over the coming months on PV Magazine. Today, um, for now, I would like to say thank you to Adele, Ines, Maria, and Alison for your insights, um, and I wish you a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, and thank you for joining. Oh. <laughs>And thank you for joining the Sustainability Session at Roundtables Europe 2022. Now you can get involved in the speed networking and explore all there is to offer on this event platform in the short break before Session 3, which is starting at 12 midday Central European Summer Time. Session 3 is called How to Decarbonize Homes Today, where we'll investigate how solar suppliers and businesses can meet the complex needs of fully electric households and what needs to change both within the household and within our industry. I'm Jonathan Gifford from PV Magazine Global. Thank you, Becky Beats, our head of content and our UP initiative initiator. And I'll be with you again on Roundtables Europe very shortly. <laughs>